Okay, guys. Uh, I mean, it's the first time for me as a host. I'm Lorenzo Patrone, and today the the my guest uh, is uh, Isabel Van Erzel from uh, Ghent, Belgium. And today we are at Paris Vascular Insight, and we're going to talk about the power of education. So it's a very powerful uh, topic, and uh, I can't wait to hear from Isabel what uh, she thinks. So, for example, uh, we are here in uh, in Paris, and you organized yesterday a great. Uh, amount of workshops uh, which are going actually along the whole uh, Congress. Uh, can you tell us about these workshops, how they were, what was the idea behind them, how successful they were? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you, Lorenzo, for the question. We want to do something for any vascular surgery trainee consultant, even for cardiologists, even for interventional radiologists like yourself. We want to provide hands-on training sessions. So not just talk about it, but really do something. And we have uh, organized a mixture of open surgical workshops, but also endovascular workshops. And this is not only uh, my task, it's actually a, a conjoint task from me and Adrian Hertog, who is a vascular surgeon here in Lille in France, who was trained by uh, Stéphane Hollon. And we've joined uh, forces. And so we set up courses um, for about two hours because people also want to attend a great program here at Palavascular Insights. And we give them the opportunity to have hands-on training. So there's only a small introduction with a lecture, and then they get hands-on opportunities. So at this very moment, they're currently doing carotid endarterectomy and coil embolization. This morning, we've done the first hands-on course focusing on an infected stent graft and how to get it out and replace it by a vovine patch uh, or by venous uh, allografts, whatever we want to use. And yesterday, we've done, uh, yeah, you were part of it, a workshop focusing on endovascular treatment for fempopletial lesions and what do you need in your toolbox going actually from a sheet to wire balloon stents and also of course the vessel prep using laser using atherectomy devices etc and how important is for you for people like junior doctors or like a young specialist to have this kind of training so essentially i mean it's not just about the material it's also about as you said hands on so trying to understand how things look and how things are in real, sort of real uh, fake life. So what do you think is the think added it, value of, uh, yeah, of something like this? Yeah, I think all these type of simulation-based training are increasingly becoming important. As we all know, our trainees there only can work a certain amount of hours per week, 48 hours in some countries, 60 hours in others. Secondly, the cases are getting more and more challenging. People are coming in and out of the hospital, they're old. So they don't have enough hands-on training opportunities. So that's the first reason. The second reason is old patients want to be treated by somebody who can do it. Mm. So they don't want to be trained by a trainee who's never done it before. So ideally, we should train some of the skills as much as possible on a plastic module or any fancy module before actually using your skills in real patients. So it's not here to replace anything, but it's really here to help them, to make them feel more confident that they already know, okay, this is what I'm going to be doing. These are the steps. These are the tools that I need to have. And this is how I'm going to be using them. And then they can really focus on some very specialized skills that they would like to train from guys like you mm. who have a lot of... Uh, experience when treating very challenging lesions. No, I think it's great. And actually, uh, it's, it's very interesting also how these congresses nowadays are, are made. So essentially, I think there are, there are big sessions, small sessions, hands-on session. I mean, I've been to EVC. Uh, you know, I think EVC is a, is a great format. How do you see the future of education during congresses? Mm -hmm. Which congresses are going to stay because with, with lack of funding, especially from industries, and which parts of congresses needs to leave sort of well i think the crucial thing for if you really want to provide good educational sessions is to still have physicians present so you can have a mixture of industry and physicians present but it should not be solely industry teaching so you need to have the input who's really clinically active and who knows all the tips and tricks so that's one thing because sometimes you see i'm not against industrial workshops but then it's mainly the industry teaching but then you do not always get the input from a physician so i think the conference that will stay it's a mixture of science with education, ideally science with these interactive sessions here at PVI. I think it's great. They're based on a case and there's a lot of discussion. People from the room actually are asking questions. Those um, kind of congresses where you just go and sit back and relax in your chair and you listen to talks and talks and talks, there's no discussion. I think they have no value in the long run. Exactly. So how do you see, for example, there are some congresses which are really focused on single uh, you know, individuals. For example, I would say the Vith Symposium is uh, about Frank Vith, is about New York, so it's about, you know, it's a congress which is fancy. But, you know, compared to these new kind of uh, uh, congresses where there's more interaction, there's more discussion, discussion happens 
within or even at the end of every single uh, talk. Do you, what do you think? Where, where are we moving? I mean, of course, Vith came up with this kind of new format with very, very fast presentation to react to this kind of very long, probably, uh, you know, long talks uh, from a professor. So at that time, it was revolutionary. What's the, what's going to be the new revolution for you? Very challenging question for me because the Vith Symposium was the first symposium I ever attended when I was a general surgery trainee and I love to go there every year, not just for New York, but mainly for the Vith Symposium and Frank Vith himself as a person because I think he has changed a lot in vascular surgery. In the main session, I agree, there are five-minute talks and the discussion is often not, there's not enough questions actually being asked. People are overrunning and there's like five minutes left after 20 talks, so there's not a lot you can learn. However, if you've ever been to the associate faculty program, which is downstairs, there people actually present and each young trainee or even consultant gets at least three or four questions. So you're being challenged about whatever you've done a clinical case, researcher, I think that's pretty valuable. I think the ideal situation is something in between, and I think that's where Paris Vascular Insights is really making a difference. The talks are not that long, but there's more room for discussion, and I think we need that. Charing Cross used to be like that. I think it's also changed quite a lot. So if you ask me, I think there's always will be room for some theoretical sessions. I personally also believe they should be short, if I have a lecture of 20 minutes and somebody's starting an introduction of 10 minutes, I'll just leave or I fall asleep. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's <laughs> actually, you know, this is a, this is also the point. I mean, I, my, I started with doing also my own event uh, last year I've done called FYA, Find Your Algorithm. And this event is mainly, you know, the, the discussion is within the presentation. So mm -hmm. I'm silly enough to stop people very often doing a presentation because I mean, I think it's uh, every time we talk like now, I mean, it's not like I'm talking to, for, to you for 10 minutes. And then you're gonna, you're gonna ask questions. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation. So yep. I think it makes more sense yep. to move. And I have this vision that we're gonna move more and more towards this format compared to like a very standard presentation. But how do you motivate people to participate in the discussion? Now we'll ask you a question. Ah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's uh, as, as Kuhn uh, Deloze says, you know, essentially sometimes it's difficult to put the microphone close to the mouth of uh, some random people. They could feel, you know, uh, intimidated, scared. And also, you know, sometimes English is the, the first language or, you know, very well uh, uh, possessed. But I think it's if you create an environment where it's a friendly, open discussion, mm -hmm. people will feel motivated. If you start saying, okay, guys, we're all on the same boat. We are all face difficulties. There are no professors. Then there's no audience. There's just people who are trying to uh, go through the everyday struggle together. I think, you know, it, it, it changes a lot, uh, the cards on the table, because it's, it's more friendly. Yeah, I fully agree. It? I guess the safe environment, that's the same for the hands-on training sessions. It needs to be safe. So even if you make stupid mistakes or you ask stupid questions, there's no problem with that. I think you can only learn from it and it's better to do it during an educational session than doing it on a patient. Exactly. And we all make mistakes anyway, so we're humans. And actually, you know, I want to touch with you, uh, I think a topic that you're very sensitive. So female surgeons, I mean, the education of a female, you are female, you are a surgeon, and you have children. So these three things, you know, could, uh, could, you know, this could be a bit of conflict between uh, all, mm -hmm. all, all the, the three of things. So of course, for a female surgeon and who wants to have like a normal family life or have children, education could be an issue. Uh, what do you think? Because there are more and more female surgeons in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the, everywhere in the, in the world. And uh, what do you think is the challenge? And how do you think we can, uh, you know, f face and resolve these challenges for female surgeons? I think, um, as a female surgeon, I think there's indeed, like you say, you want to become a good vascular surgeon. You want to be a good wife. And you want to be a perfect mother. I think if those are the three things you want to be, it's never going to work. So I think even as a female surgeon, you have to make choices. So I'm very lucky. I have a husband who is a nurse, works in intensive care, who's still active. And he's actually taking over all my female jobs, so to speak. I'm sure that a lot of females, in a lot of females, that's not the case. So I think you really have to have a conversation. I think, first of all, you need to have a family who's supportive of you wanting a career. And especially also if you want to then go and give lectures or give presentations or run workshops, you need somebody to back you up. So that's number one. And I think it's a mentality thing. I think people will change. I'm sure that in Italy, where you come from originally, it's normal that the female will stay at home when they're children. I think that's something that may be changing. Less and less, yes. Yeah, so I think the good thing for females is also, okay, we have now simulation-based training. So although you may be breastfeeding, although you may be recovering, for example, from your pregnancy, there's possibilities now to have hands-on training at home, online. Those things do tend to exist and will become only more popular. And the second thing is, I think, if you've been away from maternity leave for like a year, then you kind of have to get back into the whole 
system. Okay, how was I doing that? I forgot some of my skills. And then you can actually refresh them during these training courses. With regards to leadership and management, I think uh, we females running a little bit behind. I think because of several reasons. I think we're never going to be male. And I think that's also good. I think we need to have both uh, because we have different mentalities and different visions. Uh, but also sometimes I think we have difficulties to kind of put things in perspective. Sometimes we're like, I want to do this, this, and this, and this is how I do it. While a male is like, okay, come on, everything will be all right. So I think ideally you should have both skills. But I think the most, and the, the biggest problem for me, if I would become a lead, is I don't have that many management skills. And I don't know enough about finances. And I think those are things that uh, we can improve by getting support. For example, the Silk Road Company in the United States is now uh, trying to organize dedicated female sessions to teach them, okay, this is something, or to share experiences with other colleagues. Like, this is what I've experienced. This is how I organize my service and share what you can actually learn from one another. I guess it's the same what the males do. And what do you think? Because you mentioned the, the online education. So, for example, how do you think these uh, things are going to stay and how do you think that even they're going to they're gonna grow in uh, this kind of thing for which which kind of uh, which kind of contribution still the the remote education can give to the young physicians well, i think evc has done the same when there was the covid pandemic they've actually offered some hands-on training sessions at home for example how do you actually use wires catheters how you put a stent in the iliac they've actually sent materials to the trainees EBC, at home EBC, yeah, EBC, yeah, EBC, yeah i remember and yeah. you could do that I know with uh, ESVS and also with Simuvesc, who's here now, it's a simulation company from Spain. They actually sent you a kit that you can buy at a very cheap price. And then you get online courses. You have all the tools and you can practice at home. And you have a supervisor who's at a distance and who can look at the suture you've made or whatever you've done. And who also shows you tips and tricks on how to do it. I think it will be good because people don't have to travel that much. You don't have to take that much time off of work. And thirdly, you can do it whenever it's suitable. For females, it may be when the kids are asleep or in between. Uh, if, the, if they are asleep. Yeah, if they are it. asleep. Uh, but also for the males, you can do it in between two cases, whatever you like to do. So I think it's something that will grow and will continue to exist, but it will not replace the hands-on training in real life. I think it may be kind of a preparational thing. And talk about open versus endo. You know, everything is more pushed by, you know, by less invasivity, both from the industry to more endo. And I, I've been, uh, when I was in New York last week at Vith, I was at dinner with a, with a guy from, uh, um, from an hospital in uh, King's College in London who was very open surgeon. He doesn't do any endo. And actually he told me like, we need to do the surgery. Interventional radiologists need to do the endo, which is a very old fashioned thing. How do you think that the new generation of vascular surgeons needs to face this endovascular revolution? Yeah, I'm coming from a small country, which is Belgium. And so um, we don't have the luxury like in Denmark that you have one specialist or a couple of specialists doing the endovascular work, vascular surgeons. Some do the open work, some do the carotid, some do the aorta. That is not possible. So, for example, for smaller countries, we do both. We do open and endo. And personally, I don't think it should not only be the vascular surgeon. It should not also be only the interventional radiologist. I think as long as it's an endovascular therapist who's experienced at what he's doing, and I think the most important thing is that you call for help. So if you have a problem and you know that the vascular surgeon can solve it, you can call your vascular surgeon, but the other way around, if a vascular surgeon who's only skilled in open surgery, he can call the interventional radiologist to help them out. So I think it's a team approach. Mm. And I think it doesn't matter who does it, but I think ideally as a vascular surgeon, you should have both skills. And do you think that in the long term, uh, the, the advanced uh, surgical skills are going to be a little bit lost? So less and less uh, uh, clinicians are going to be able to do like femdistal bypasses? What do you think? Yeah, I think it is. It's already happening. Uh, I think a lot of the younger people are being trained fully endovascularly. That's the same with aortic disease as well. They know very good how to put in an EVAR, but if they have to convert it to open surgery, well, first of all, I think you need to do it at a center who does, who does enough cases. So they don't, they don't do that. They just send the patients away. And I think the same is happening with endovascular peripheral disease. They do the endo and then they see, okay, I'm not getting there. Okay, so I'll refer the case to a more experienced center, which is fine. We can then decide, okay, are we going to give it another go endovascularly or should we do open surgery? I think there will be more and more specialization, more and more high volume centers. And we'll have to see. But it doesn't mean that somebody should not be able to do both. If I have to do an embolectomy, I always want to do an angiogram to make sure I've taken everything out. And even I do the embolectomy under fluoroscopy guidance. So I know exactly where any narrowing may be is, may be happening or where my catheter is going. 
uh, when I was first in London, this was done blindly and I wanted to do an angiogram and I was like, you have to call the radiographer. So I said, what? Do I have to call a radiographer to be able to do that? So every hospital, of course, in every country has its own systems. But I think it's important to do both. Oh, no, definitely. I mean, I remember even when I came to my hospital in London, uh, you know, there was no possibility for a surgeon to call the radiographer without the radiologist, which was so, I mean, nonsense, so much nonsense. But I think that we are still, uh, in many places, we're still very uh, reluctant to adapt to to a new mentality. And everyone tries to defend his own little fort. And, yeah, I think I think we should, yeah, we should not have those forts. We should work together. Like, if you want to do carotid disease, you need to have the neurologist involved. You need to have the neurointerventional radiologist, vascular surgeon could be cardio- cardiologist, could be interventional radiologist. And, and and how do you see the, the the education in in order to create specialists who can do everything, but also maybe a, a subspecialty within the specialty? How do you see the future? Someone is okay. I mean, I can do everything. But I'm very good at carotid enterectomy. I don't know. I can do everything, but I'm very good at aort. I can do everything. But I'm going to do it at lower limbs. Do you think that it, within a team, generally speaking, is it possible to subspecialize or not? I think you can subspecialize, but you have to make sure you can also cover the on-call. I think we don't want to have what happened in the improved trial, that not 24 hours per day, you had the same type of uh, services you could provide to your patients. So if you say, okay, I have a ruptured aneurysm, I want to be able to treat them by endovascular means, but then it's like, okay, I'm sorry, this, gen- this person is on annual leave or that person is ill, so we can't do it. So that's So there needs to be some crossover between the various colleagues. And this comes back to education because everyone who develops some skills yeah, so need I to think share you need them. to have some yeah. general basic and open and endovascular skills, especially also take care of emergencies. And if you're unable to treat it yourself, and that's the best way, for example, to treat a patient, then either you refer to patient to another center or you have a colleague that you can call at home who's maybe not even on call who can come and help you out. In the best world possible, a where ego, approach. where ego yeah. don't exist. Yeah, Egos yeah, do not exist. Egos do not exist. <laughs> yeah, it's in a dreamy, in a dreamy environment. Anyway, I think it's uh, it's great. I mean, uh, it's good that you 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 share some some of your time and your wi- wisdom uh, uh, with us and uh, with all our uh, listeners. And I think uh, for today is uh, is enough. And uh, I think we we touch many different hot topics, like as we said, education with uh, you know within and uh, and outside the operating uh, theater. And I think it's uh, it's going to be a long way before uh, creating a very a f- fair environment for every specialist, female, young and older, to get uh, uh, the same amount of uh, training and, uh, and skills. And, uh, you know, like uh, we're going to go back now to our activity here at uh, Paris Vascular Insight, which is uh, a great congress, a second year for this event, but I think it's going to be one of the leading congresses in Europe for the next years. Do you agree? Yep. Yeah, I fully agree. We're going to go back to teaching. Exactly. And then you, and learning. And because learning. Every time because you teach, I learn, you learn. every yeah. time. Yeah. And then uh, we're probably going to enjoy Paris tonight and yeah. then have some more lectures tomorrow. Okay. Thank you very much for the interview. Thanks and, uh, so much, And have a great Isabel. stay in Paris. Yes, we'll, we'll try. Thank you so much, Isabel. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.